Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. We wonder why millennials are different. Imagine growing up in our current highly partisan, polarized political environment and not knowing anything else. Not knowing an America where compromise is possible, where division within political parties produced candidates that moved to the center, that didn't watch Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill work across the aisle, or Lyndon Johnson exhibit political courage by being a champion of civil rights. Imagine if all you knew politically was Rush and Hannity and Maddow. For a brief and shining moment, we tried something else. Barack Obama captured it. Rather than being radical or progressive, he really was the person who looked to make America great, to bring back the better way that it used to be. Instead, the opposite has happened. It seems that every day we're fighting the same battles. Boomers in kind of one last hurrah are relitigating the fights of the 60s and 70s as things only get worse and the center cannot hold. We're going to talk about these fault lines today with Julian Zelzer and Kevin Cruz. Julian Zelzer is the Malcolm Stephen Forbes Class of 41 Professor of History and Public Affairs at Princeton. He's a CNN analyst. He's written over 900 op-eds and is the author and editor of 19 books. Kevin Cruz is a professor of history at Princeton, where he specializes in political history. And together, they're the co-authors of Fault Lines, a history of the United States since 1974. Julian Zelzer, Kevin Cruz, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Great being here. Great to have you here. One of the things that really seems at the core of this is that when you look at that period 19, roughly 1968 to 1974, that before that period, there was a general consensus that existed in the country as to where we wanted to go. There were lots of debates about how we would get there. But in terms of what the goals were, there was a general consensus. Once we got to 74 and after that, that started to break apart. There wasn't even a consensus as to where we needed to get to. Julian, start with you. Talk about that. You're, you're right, and, and there's two parts of the period that come before our book. They're at work. One is, is the Cold War, uh, and so obviously the, the presence and reality of a Cold War doesn't create consensus, but it surely, certainly creates a certain set of shared issues and concerns that we had debates about. And then you had institutions that pushed back against some of the divisions in American society. The role of a strong federal government was really important. Uh, unions, which were central to the economy uh, and provided a thread for different sectors of society. Uh, and even in the media, it was much more concentrated. You had a handful of networks. You had a handful of city papers, which, even though they didn't create agreement in the country, offered uh, a similar set of facts, a similar starting point from which we had our debates. So uh, I would to say that before the 70s, it certainly wasn't that everyone was harmonious, uh, the opposite, as we saw with civil rights in Vietnam. Uh, but there were institutions that pushed back against some of the fault lines in American society. And in the period we wrote about, those fall away. And Kevin, talk a little bit about the economic underpinning of that period, the, the way in which the, the country was doing well economically, and things seemed to change in the 70s, particularly with inflation, and, and, and that really added to the economic divide of the period. Yeah, absolutely. And so in, in the, the period before 1974 is one in which the American economy is really thriving. Uh, it's doing so uh, in part because there aren't any real global competitors uh, uh, to, to really challenge uh, American industry, but also because industry itself is, is, is really doing well and is, uh, more importantly, sharing the benefits uh, with its workers. This is a period in which we have a really strong uh, union movement uh, and uh, something that really uh, helps elevate a large number of working-class Americans into a middle-class lifestyle. And that helps paper over a lot of the divisions that you would find in society along lines of of race and ethnicity and uh, and religion and things like that that would normally uh, uh, put these uh, these people at each other's throats. Uh, and that really changes uh, starting in the 70s. Both as the industrial economy starts to falter here with deindustrialization, a lot of factories start closing. Uh, the rise of competitors abroad and challenged by uh, West German or Japanese uh, models. Uh, and it really, uh, and also then the union movement starts to falter as well. And so all of these things really combine uh, to, to start this uh, era of economic anxiety. When you talk about the things that combine, the kind of perfect storm that created this, as you break it down is into four areas, the economy, which we've been talking about, but also race, 
and, and the nature of politics and gender. Julian, talk a little bit about those four as kind of the fulcrum upon which this change rests. Yeah, I, I mean, we try to step back as historians and make some sense of uh, not only what uh, that we are divided, but to really outline what some of the major divisions are. So in, in politics, it's obviously the increased partisan polarization that you see between the parties and the way that our political and media environment fosters those. In, in the economy, it's the division, the growing division between wealthy and poor Americans as well in the middle, uh, the growing insecurity of the middle class. Uh, in terms of race, uh, the divisions continue uh, out of the 1950s and 60s, but, but as civil rights turns from issues of uh, legal segregation uh, or voting rights toward questions of institutional racism, there is no kind of consensus of how does race play out in the criminal justice system or uh, in the housing sector. Uh, and so that becomes a, a really uh, central point of tension and debate throughout the period that follows, as well as a resurgence of white nationalism since the 1990s here in the United States. Uh, and finally, gender and sexuality are, are really uh, important points of division and progress during this period as the feminist movement uh, and the gay rights movement put new ideas and new issues on the table that really challenge conventional notions of the family uh, or conventional notions of rights, and there's a reaction to it. Uh, and the conservative movement will spend a lot of its time since the 70s trying to fight back against what these social movements are trying to offer. And Kevin, what role does the fragmentation of the media during this period play in the way all of this change is reported and then fed back to the American people? It's a vitally important story here. And again, when we talk about the fault lines in our title, we mean those four lines that you and Julian just discussed. But we also mean uh, the media here because it's about the lines that we're told about who's at fault for all these changes. Uh, and the changes in the media really are important. Again, to go back to that earlier period. It was a period in which you really had a monolithic media. You had you know, the big three television networks with their evening news programs. You had a few major metropolitan newspapers. And together, they really set the tone, not just in terms of the basic information that they all agreed upon that, that was provided to Americans, but also a basic narrative driven out of that. That really starts to fracture starting in the 70s. Uh, uh, and it really, it's the story we tell really beginning in uh, the late 70s with the rise of cable television. Uh, and the institution of what uh, MTV uh, executives like to call narrow casting. Rather than trying to reach out to a broad segment of the audience, you're going to just reach for a small slice of that. And when that gets uh, picked up by, uh, by news networks, first CNN in 1980 and then later on Fox News, uh, you start to see uh, the news climate uh, slice and dice. It accelerates with the rise of talk radio after the drop of the Fairness Doctrine in the late 80s. And you suddenly have uh, major conservative voices making use of, uh, of talk radio like Rush Limbaugh. Uh, then Fox News in the 90s. And it really picks up uh, even more speed uh, with the, uh, the advent of the Internet, uh, where suddenly you've got uh, not just, you know, 500 cable channels to choose from, but, uh, but millions of websites. And you can find an audience uh, that is speaking back to you, uh, that shares the exact same values, the exact same opinions, uh, the exact same set of facts. The parallel part of this is also the political leadership at the time and the way political leadership exploited this, Newt Gingrich perhaps being the penultimate example. Talk a little bit about that, Julian. Yeah, well, I'm, as, as the, the uh, political economy of the nation changes, you have more leaders who understand what the incentives are, uh, and they're entrepreneurs, uh, you can call them that, uh, who really try to exploit the divisions, fuel the divisions, and use them to achieve uh, power for themselves and for their party. Gingrich is a really important figure, uh, both in the 1980s when he's a backbencher who's really shaking up American politics. He goes on C-SPAN and he starts attacking Democrats for being weak on defense and asks them to respond, even though no one's actually in the chamber, uh, to the time when he's Speaker of the House after 1994 and will start the process that culminates uh, in the effort to impeach President Bill Clinton. And Gingrich is someone who, who very much understands, as a historian, how American politics has changed and how important partisan polarization is. 
and, and he capitalizes on it, and he looks for issues that will uh, further the divisions in the electorate and take advantage of the fact um, that you know parts of the country will never go along with what the leaders of the other party say. And we're seeing that in steroids with President Trump, who, who also is part of that trajectory. So Gingrich, Tom DeLay, Donald Trump are very much uh, products of the era. And Kevin and I argue that you see the shift more pronounced with the Republican Party than the Democratic Party. In some ways, they embrace the era uh, more vigorously than the Democrats do, uh, and they structure their partisan strategy accordingly. Kevin, there's, there was a period of time, and I guess maybe it was the late 80s, early 90s, and, and pre-Clinton in, in some respects, that there was a sense on the part of Americans of trying to move to the center. More and more Americans identified with being moderate. Here in California, you had the rise of decline to state as the largest, the largest voting bloc. And then that got more partisan again. And then it seems there was another attempt to try and find the middle ground that, that was personified by Barack Obama. And then we've gone back again to the worst of all of this. Talk a little bit about it in terms of these cycles we seem to be going through. Well, there, there are these, uh, these perennial efforts to try to find the middle ground. Uh, usually, though, we find that the middle ground is, is pretty elusive. Uh, if people say they don't like this party or that party. They imagine a middle ground. Um, the problem is that not everyone agrees on what that middle ground looks like. Um, and sometimes we've seen, as you noted, people like uh, Barack Obama, who, who tried to, to, even though he was you know, a Democrat, tried to reach across the aisle, and found that the, uh, the lines of partisanship have become uh, much more pronounced, much more harder uh, to cross. And so uh, you know, his big drive was to try to create what he called uh, a post-partisan politics. Uh, but he found out very quickly that his efforts at bipartisanship uh, could be thwarted simply if the Republicans lined up uh, in ranks, as Mitch McConnell and Eric Cantor urged them to do in early uh, in 2009 and 2010. Uh, and to deny any uh, any bipartisanship, to just to refuse to vote for whatever the president uh, offered. So we've really seen these lines harden. There's, there's always a perennial desire to reach across the aisle to find this middle ground, I think. And I think a lot of, uh, of voters feel that. Uh, but the way in which the two-party system is set up is to become increasingly hard uh, to move beyond that. One of the things that is at the core of this as well is the sense that we seem to be relitigating over and over and over again so many of these same issues, variations of these four pillars that you talk about. One wonders, Julian, if, you, if the country doesn't reach a sense of fatigue from all of this at some point. Well, uh, some, some hope we reach that, uh, and, uh, and the reason this is happening is in part it's, it's a result of dysfunction. So uh, if you have a political system that is not really capable of handling big problems and you have one political party, the GOP, that's not particularly invested in making big policy changes um, after the conservative revolution on some of these questions, uh, it, it's reasonable, rational, and predictable that you never really solve them. Uh, that combined with genuine divisions in the electorate over some of these problems uh, where it's impossible to find any kind of common ground. Will the public eventually become exhausted with this? You know, that was Barack Obama's hope when he made his famous speech in 2004, as Kevin's talking about. Uh, the hope was a lot of the nation was with him, or a lot of the political system would move along with him uh, and, and understand why the exhaustion meant we needed a post-partisan uh, era, whatever that meant. But, but it's unrealistic to expect that at this point. I think even if people, voters are exhausted, uh, all the incentives of the political world that they live in right now are structured to get them energized and excited again about the fight. Uh, and the same holds true in, in Washington. So, so I think we're a long way from any kind of turning point. Take that one step further. Is there something that is systemically wrong that, that simply cannot be fixed because of the nature of the way the country, the media, all these things have changed over time, that it's just simply not fixable within the current system? I don't think it's, I don't think it's that it's not fixable. I, I think what what we could see here is that there are and maybe Julian has some thoughts on this too. But but what we could see here is that uh, if we look across this period, there are periods in which 
uh, it looks like things are frozen in place. It looks like there's no possibility of change. And actually, we do see change bubbling up from below. Uh, even uh, is the, the, the conservative movement that dominates this period starts out as a social movement on the outside and moves in. And that's a story we see throughout this period of, of, of change coming up from below, uh, of really challenging the insurance system. Uh, these are rules we've set up for ourselves. Uh, and so in terms of whether it be uh, gerrymandering or campaign finance or all the things that really kind of steer us into our current system, they can be undone. Uh, the story that we tell begins in the wake of Watergate, where there's a series of, of serious reforms that, that really do reshape uh, the political system. Uh, that can be done again. Do things have to get that bad, though, Julian, in order for them to get better? Watergate is, is, is a good example because it really took something as, as profound as that to create these kind of reforms. Yeah, I, I think that's the case. And, and I think even earlier periods of American history bear that out. The, the moments when uh, the politicians of our country are really attentive to issues of political reform. How do our processes work? How do our institutions work? And what's wrong with them? They're far and few between. Uh, you could point to the progressive era in the early 20th century. You could point to the 1970s. Uh, other than that, it's really scattershot. And, and what usually happens is uh, total dysfunction creates a, you know, new political momentum for reform. Politicians have the idea that if they don't do something about the system, voters will vote them out of office. Uh, and, and in the 70s, it was a combination of really a major political scandal that, that put the nation through incredible trauma after all the turmoil of Vietnam had already shaken us to the core, combined with our inability to deal with big policy problems that were emerging. That's, that's the same sort of dysfunction we see today. Back then, we couldn't really handle the energy crisis of the 70s. There wasn't any clear response to the stagflation in the economy, the combination of unemployment and high uh, inflation. And uh, that created the room for politicians to say, we're going to spend some of our political time and capital on issues like creating an independent prosecutor or trying to reform the campaign finance system. But it takes a lot of bad things to happen uh, to move us, not just the politicians, but voters who traditionally don't rank reform issues very high, uh, it, to, to get them to the place where they say, we need to start with the process or we're never going to get to a better political moment as a country. Kevin, to, to the further that, we were talking before about the changes in the media landscape. In so many respects, there are politicians by playing to the perennial base that benefit by the dysfunction. There, there's an argument to be made that dysfunction helps get some of these people reelected. Oh, absolutely. And I think one of the stories that we, we tell in the book is, is really uh, that it's not a, a case of uh, um, uh, the country um, uh, inadvertently drifts towards more polarization and, and partisanship. It's that there are incentives there that really do feed right. into this. And so uh, whether it be uh, a gerrymandering or, or, or the changes in campaign finance, uh, the way in which uh, the media increasingly amplifies this. Uh, you know, in an earlier era, you didn't have uh, a Fox News on the right or or, or uh, a liberal outlets on the left, uh, kind of a, a ramping up voters and making uh, unrealistic expectations of their uh, other representatives. Uh, so, so there are a lot of trends here that actually. Uh, it's not just that this happens in spite of our, our best interests. It's that there are a lot of incentive that push people to the corners. Both of you, historically, Kevin, start with you. Historically, where can we look for examples that are helpful in understanding the current situation? Well, again, I, I think we, we, throughout this period, you can, you can see a number of moments in which uh, 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 at varying times uh, these different flashpoints have come up. Uh, now uh, I think we seem to be overwhelmed because all these different fault lines seem to, seem to be uh, cracking wide open at once. The uh, political polarization is incredibly pronounced. Economic inequality is at its highest levels. Uh, conflicts over over race are certainly uh, more in our face than they had been over the previous few decades. Uh, the fights over gender and sexuality uh, are as well. Uh, think about you know the, the 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 Black Lives Matter movement. Me too. These are are really important movements, but but all of them have a history. And if we look back across this period, you can see them coming up. Uh, at one time or another throughout the past, 
What I think is really um, uh, uh, frustrating at the moment is that all four seem to be breaking through at one moment. Julian? Yeah, I, I you know, I agree. That's why that's why we wrote the book together. We're in agreement. And, you know, the, the uh, kind of ways in which the Trump presidency is working in the state of American politics today really is many of the trends and, and many of the stories we tell over this four-decade period coming together in a very explosive and unstable moment. And and we, we added a chapter to the book once President Trump uh, became president, uh, in part to cover his presidency, but in, this is built on top of, of four decades of, you know, brutal uh, political, economic, and social division. And what you're seeing every day is how this manifests itself uh, and how it's normalized in political life. And you're watching a politician at the highest level of power willing, as we said, to exploit this and to play to this. Um, but, but he is the product of this era, this era millennials have grown up uh, watching, Generation X has grown up watching. Uh, this, is, this is our times. Is there historical precedent? Is there somewhere else in American history we should look for guideposts along the way? Well, I'll jump in. There's lots of periods of political division. Obviously, we're not at the place we were in the 19th century where you have a civil war, total breakdown uh, into violent conflict, intense partisanship in the late 19th century. And that's part of what the progressive era is a response to. That's why we get uh, this idea of objective journalism. It's a response to what we had before, a very partisan press. A lot of the reforms in the early 20th century were meant uh, to undercut some of the power of political parties uh, and, and develop sources of expertise and bureaucracy to move away from that. So um, we can look to periods where we've had intense partisanship and, and social and economic division, and we've, we've survived them. Uh, so so that, that's not necessarily a guide to how we get out of this uh, and whether we need to get out of this. But certainly our country is not a country with a history of of great calm and consensus. It's full of discord. And in some ways, what was really exceptional was the period before the period we study, uh, in terms of not that there weren't intense divisions, but there were these countervailing forces we're talking about that pushed against that. And that might be what's needed today. And how important, finally, is leadership in all of this? Julian, start with you, and then Kevin. How important is the right kind of, of either charismatic leadership or, or political party leadership? How important are individuals in, in trying to create this change? They're important. Uh, in, in general, uh, it, it's limited. I, I, I mean, I think that's part of the point we're trying to make, that we shouldn't count too much on a president or even some kind of social movement leader, uh, the, the new version of someone like Martin Luther King, to be able to totally transform us. Because all these issues we're talking about are rooted in the way things work, it's hard for a leader to, to end that. Um, and so there's limits on what any leader can achieve. That said, great leaders can have an immense impact. President Roosevelt in the 1930s uh, really was able to transform the way we thought about our economic problems, to transform our basic public policies in terms of the economy, and then in terms of World War II. And so who the next president is and, and who leads our Congress still has an effect, even if it's limited, uh, as do social movement leaders. I mean, we, we argue that even in this period of division uh, and tension, since the 1970s, you see again and again the power grassroots movements with the right leaders can have, uh, from the conservative movement that reshapes pol political debate in the 70s to the gay rights movement, which puts issues like AIDS on the agenda and same-sex marriage, uh, all the way to the Parkland students recently who uh, made uh, politicians and the media focus on gun control regardless of if whether they wanted to or not. So leaders from the grassroots to the present can make a difference. They won't fix everything. It's going to take a lot more, uh, but we need to at least start there. Kevin Cruz, Julian Zelzer, their book is Fault Lines, A History of the United States Since 1974. I thank you both so much for spending time with us. Thanks for having me. Thank you.